Hey, this is Kevin Riles with The Real Estate of Life with Kevin Riles. This week, things to make you go, hmm, when it comes to residential contracts. I get questions in the office all the time. So I'm going to actually go through a residential contract for Texas, and we're going to figure this thing out and so that you won't be going, hmm. DJ, hit that music, please. Support for this program comes from the Digital Broadcasting Network, presenting podcasts and web series from everyday people who have an extraordinary passion to make the world a better place. Hey, welcome back to The Real Estate of Life with Kevin Riles. This is your host, Kevin Riles. And this week, we are talking about things that make you go, hmm, when it comes to residential contracts, uh, specifically in the state of Texas. I would tell you for my worldwide universal audience, because I know I have listeners all across the country, that most real estate, residential real estate contracts, for the most part, uh, are the same, at least in my uh, opinion. Uh, there are different nuances based on certain states and things of that nature. Uh, I have a friend uh, who was asking me uh, to review some stuff uh, uh, in D.C., in Washington, D.C., and, for instance, their contract is different uh, because they have a transfer tax. Uh, when they sell uh, property, that they actually pay a tax on that transfer. So uh, we live in a red state, and that's just not what we do in Texas. You know, Texas is different. <laughs> so uh, long story short, um, you know, as always, let me preface is by saying, I'm putting my hand, for those of you watching on, on video, I'm putting my hand up like I'm taking an oath. I am not an attorney. Seek the advice of an attorney when it comes to all contracts. I am just talking about experiential knowledge uh, based on me doing this for 20 years as of next month, as a matter of fact. I've been in the business 20 years, October 2018, 20 years. Um, so that was not in my oath. But anyway, long story short, uh, always seek the advice of, of an attorney. I'm just talking, talking to you from a real estate broker standpoint. Why am I going over this? So let me be completely and totally transparent, honest, because that's what we do on The Real Estate of Life, and that's who I am, Kevin Riles. I get this question about go over the contract so much, which is what we're supposed to do as real estate uh, brokers and agents, uh, that I'm doing this for two reasons. One, so that I can eventually send this video and or audio to my client so that they can listen to it. Uh, and then that way that might save me a couple of minutes as far as, you know, having to go over the contract in detail. So this is selfish reasons. And then two, I think it's helpful that everyone know. So I'm doing it for you, but kind of selfishly uh, for me as well, because this video will be used when someone says, hey, you know, uh, when I say, hey, if you want me to go up the contract, great. I can go over, you know, generally or, or go in, in detail or I can send you this video that's probably not going to be more than, say, 20 or 30 minutes long, and you can uh, watch the video and watch all the animation and watch how fun I make this uh, contract reading. I'm not going to read the contract. Uh, so, anyway, long story short, for those of you that will see this in the future, I did this for you. All right, so I am looking at a one to four residential contract in uh, the state of Texas. Um, residential, uh, because I think this would be the most helpful. I may do this for uh, for commercial, but since most people at least buy their own home, I thought it would be important for me to just kind of go over general provisions. I am not going to read this contract uh, from verbatim. Uh, that is for you and your broker to do uh, when uh, uh, when you uh, purchase a residential property, but I just thought it to be important. Uh, so basically, I, I, this is how I explain it to my clients. And so um, there are paragraphs in this particular contract, one, two, three, four, five, all the way, I think, to 20, I think 27 or 28. I'll find out here in a second as I, I, I look at it. Uh, and so each paragraph has a particular provision. So first paragraph is parties. Who's buying the property? And what I'll do is try to insert some just opinions as I uh, go through this. Uh, so one of the things that uh, you have to be aware of in Texas is that we are a community property state. Or as Eddie Murphy said uh, in his stand-up, Eddie, half? You know, half, half? Yeah, so uh, your wife, uh, your significant other, gets uh, or your husband gets half of what you buy right there are provisions as far as separate property and things of that nature but that's beyond the scope of this so if you're buying a property and you're married uh, then the parties listed on this particular property uh, uh, are um, you and your wife or if it's just you which is fine you can buy so for instance I'm married to the beautiful share Riles. shout out to my wife she looked good I see you um, but uh, if I buy a property um, uh, I'd say an investment property uh, in um, my name, when we get to closing, um, the deed will be drawn up in both of our names because we're in a community property state. So whether the loan is in my name or not, uh, it, it, it doesn't matter. So in other words, I could have the loan just in my name, but the deed and deed of trust, which is the lien placed against the property, will be uh, signed by your spouse. So depending on how your loan is, this is who, what you want to put in this, this parties as far as the buyer. On the seller side, community property state, 
community property as far as the contract is concerned. So if you are married, for the most part, uh, unless it is family separate property that's delineated separately uh, legally, which happens um, not that often, uh, it will be both you and your spouse uh, that will be listed as, as sellers. Uh, so that's paragraph number one, who's buying, who's selling. Paragraph number two is what are we buying and what are we selling? Uh, so that's the legal description. That's actually how um, real estate transfers in the state of Texas. It does not transfer by address. Address is a post office uh, nomenclature. Legal description, lot, block, um, meets and bounds, things of that nature uh, are, is how property transfers. So you'll see uh, in property lot uh, four, block two of um, certain subdivision known as, um, in a certain city, in a certain county known as 123 ABC Street. So that lot and block, though, is the actual way it is it is transferred, meaning that that is what is recorded in the deed, not the address, uh, is the uh, legal description. And then you'll see, so they'll have the land or legal description. You'll see stuff in there about improvements. So I'm selling this legal description, and then I'm selling the improvements on top of the legal description. Now, if this is a lot, then you're just selling the land. But if there's something on top, i.e. a house or residential property, then that is transferring as a part of this particular uh, transaction. The contract goes into great detail as to um, any permanently installed or built-in items. Very key here. Remember that if you have speakers, like a surround sound, if you have ceiling fans that you really like and you've paid a lot of money for, if you have... Um, um, kitchen equipment that you're going to take, it is very important that you exclude those if you're going to take with you. So if you're taking your surround sound, and, which is not just your equipment that is not permanently affixed, but your surround sound speakers that are in the wall, then you need to disclose that in this particular contract. Uh, there's a section called exclusions to tell the buyer, hey, I'm taking my bows out of the wall. You have to replace those. And that needs to be done at contract. Do not do that after you go under contract because once you sign this contract, you have committed to giving them those permanently installed items, right? So I'm not going to go over that whole uh, list, but there's a significant list of things, water softener, um, uh, outdoor cooking equipment, things that if you, hey, no, I'm taking my grill. Uh, with me that's uh, installed like those outdoor kitchens is really nice as popular now you need to uh, let people know that all right and then accessories you also need to let people know if you're taking your drapes right uh, and I, I had a situation where I made a mistake and I ended up compensating uh, the seller where I did not explain that to the seller she was going to take her drapes and um, she started taking her drapes and the buyer said no 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 you didn't exclude that and so I did not tell the seller that and so she ended up leaving the um the drapes and i paid her for her drapes because i made the mistake in not explaining that so that's the reason for this video all right so uh this was a long time ago but it's just important for you to know uh, and then reservations any reservation of oil gas and mineral rights is made in accordance uh, with an attached addendum so if you're selling a property nine times out of ten if you're selling in a subdivision or kind of a modernized place the oil and the mineral rights have been sold many times and uh, uh ago but for instance i have two uh at this current time have uh Three, actually, large acre tracks, 41 acres out in Beasley, Kendleton area in, in Texas, for those of you from familiar, uh, and on the north side of Houston. And so uh, in all of those listing agreements, uh, the sellers tell me, one, whether they own the mineral rights, and two, mineral meaning oil or anything else, and two, whether they, that is included in the sale. If they're not included in the sale, then there's a minim, amendment um, to the contract that says that. All right, so... That's an important paragraph that people kind of skip over because it really has some important stuff on there as far as what am I selling. Sales price. Sales price is easy. Um, down payment plus how much you're financing equals the sales price. So you're buying a million-dollar property. You're putting $200,000 down. Uh, then $200,000 plus $800,000 in financing equals a million dollars. That simple. Uh, no more complicated than that. If it's a cash deal, then it's uh, and it's a million dollar property, then a million dollars with zero dollars in financing equals a million dollars. So A plus B equals C. Um, so n nothing really go over there. Uh, paragraph number four in the tech Trek contract, Texas Real Estate Commission contract, that's who promulgates our contracts, has license holder disclosure. And it basically says that if you are a Texas real estate license and you're going to be more than 10% of this transaction, you need to disclose that. So that's only for the realtors out there. Five, earnest money. Earnest money is uh, for those of you that are that that y'all remember in Friday, uh, the movie Friday, the classic African American uh, uh, movie 
uh, of, of tales of, uh, of Friday in the neighborhood, also known as the hood. For those of you that may be unfamiliar, well, there's a there's a um, um, there's a, a character in there called Smokey, and there's a scene in there where Sm- Smokey is looking for his money, and uh, uh, Smokey is serious about his money, and so he says something about being serious about his money. So Ernest Money. As described, I know that's a colloquialism. I know that's kinfolk uh, based, but I just thought I would share that with the with the uh, mass audience. Earnest money tells the seller, "I'm serious. I'm earnest. So I'm going to put up some money up front to basically say that, hey, I am serious about this, and I'm so serious that I'm going to put up X amount of dollars uh, and to be held by a title company uh, to buy this particular property. There's no pre uh, amount, no negotiated. I mean, it's a negotiation as far as how much earnest money is concerned. Some uh, realtors like to put one percent of the sales price or two percent of the sales price, but uh, earnest money could be a dollar, or earnest money actually could be zero on the contract. You don't have to have earnest money, but most sellers won't accept a contract without earnest money. So, the earnest money prior graph it tells how much the earnest money is. It tells what the title company uh, or what escrow officer uh, that uh, you're going to deposit it, and then it also says. That if you don't deliver it within a, a certain amount of time, the seller can uh, can terminate the contract. So if you go under contract and you say you're going to put up two thousand dollars in earnest money and you never deliver it to the title company, the seller can terminate uh, the contract. Uh, so time is of the essence as far as putting that uh, particular earnest money up. All right. So what does the title company do? I'm giving this money to the title company. The title company is a third party. Uh, uninterested third party, I should say uninterested third party, they are neutral in this transaction. They are basically a transaction facilitator, one, and two, they provide title insurance that says that the person that is selling this property is the person that's supposed to be selling the property and there's no liens, adverse liens or any other things that are going on as far as the property. And for that, they issue a title insurance policy to you, the buyer, uh, and they also um, can issue a owner's title policy to the protect, protect the lender as well. So, the next paragraph, title policy and survey, um, the seller, uh, I'm sorry, um, it says the seller will furnish to buyer at, and then it says who's going to pay for the title policy. On average, the title policy about it costs about 1% uh, of the sales price of the house. This is a negotiable point, who pays for the title policy. I will tell you that a majority, I'm going to say over 90%, uh, of the time, the seller pays for the title policy because the seller is proving to the buyer that I am the rightful owner of this property and that there uh, it has clean title and you're going to be okay. However, sometimes for whatever reason, negotiation, sellers motivated, um, sellers has a, I know I have a good deal. I'm not paying any closing costs, so the buyer will pay it as well. But that is a negotiable point. And then it says who's going to issue the title policy in that particular uh, uh, paragraph as well. It's pretty. Uh, Six is a total, total title policy and survey. It's a relatively long um, section of the contract, and it goes over quite a bit. And I'm not going to go over it in huge amount of detail other than to say uh, that uh, it is important for uh, you to understand that what the title policy is, what it says, when uh, it's time sensitive as far as dates are concerned, um, uh, and then the other part of this par- uh, paragraph that is important that I, I want to talk about is the survey. The survey is a ma- map outline of your property line. So it literally looks like if uh, I'm looking from a Google Earth and I'm looking down on a property, where's my property line? Where's my setback lines as far as what I can build? Where the utilities uh, go across? What's the uh, utility easements? Things of that nature. Uh, in residential real estate, um, it is nomenclature. It's a negotiable point. Let me also say this. It's a negotiable point. But it's relatively normal for the seller to provide a survey. Hopefully, they've had one done when they purchased the property. However, it is a negotiable uh, uh, point um, as far as them providing it. If the seller does not have one, then it is nomenclature typically for the buyer to pay for one. Uh, right? Again, this is normally It's a negotiable point because I'm going to have some realtors out there saying, well, I, I never had it. I'm telling you, this is what normally happens. And so in the paragraph of 6C, uh, when it talks about survey, it has check boxes that basically allow you to negotiate who's going to pay for the survey. If the seller has a survey and it is not sufficient for the bank or the title company, then what happens after that? And again, that's beyond the scope of, uh, of this particular podcast and video. Uh, but just realize that there's important information as to who pays for the survey. Uh, and then also objections. So I get the title policy back as a buyer. I need time to look at it and see if I object to anything in it. 
Uh, and so there's a provision in here that allows for you to re, uh, object it, object to it for either a certain type of activity. Say that you're buying a residential property, but you're going to use it for commercial use. Well, is that uh, allowed in the HOA? Is that allowed in the area that you're buying it? And so therefore you can put, if it's, if I can object, if it's not allowed for the use I wanted to use it. And then you can also object to items that are found in the title policy. And, and I do plan to do a podcast in and of itself and have a title person come in and talk about the title policy in and of itself, all the schedules and things of that nature. Uh, but it does go into that. Um, and so uh, in the contract in E6E, it talks about abstract the title policy, basically suggesting that you should get an attorney to review your title policy. I will tell you that most people don't do that, not because I don't recommend it. It's just they they typically don't for whatever reason. It also talks about membership and homeowners association. If you are, there's an addendum attached uh, to that. Uh, and uh, it tries to do a lot of explaining because we had so many issues with HOAs uh, and, so, and, and foreclosing on folks and things of that nature. So in the new contracts, they've spent a lot of time in that paragraph trying to explain what a property homeowners association can do and that what you need to be aware of. Uh, talks about statutory tax districts and, you know, you need to be aware of what tax districts you're in. Uh, talks about tide waters. If you're in, uh, if, if you're on a coastal area, things of that nature. Talks about annexation that the seller cannot control annexation if the city's going to annex or county's going to annex a certain portion. Uh, so that's kind of a CYA for the seller. Uh, it talks about property located in um, a service area, utility service provider, or MUD, Municipal Utility District, here in uh, Houston. For those of you outside of Texas, you have no idea what a MUD is, but uh, it is essentially a way for um, the developer to provide um, uh, utilities. Talks about public improvement districts, talks about transfer fees, talks about propane gas service area, and, and notice of water level fluctuation. So basically that entire section is a CYA, cover your assets pause um, for um, uh, for uh, the seller and it's something that the buyer should really pay attention to seller too but the buyer seven property condition this always gets people um, uh, confused uh, in this particular uh, section Texas property code requires that the seller provide a seller's disclosure that seller's disclosure is the seller saying this is what I know about my property and I'm going to disclose whether it has cable lines I'm going to disclose whether it's ever flooded out before I'm going to disclose if I've just replaced the roof I'm going to give you any reports that have been done I think within the last five years uh, and so all you're attesting to as a buyer in this particular section is saying that hey um, the buyer has received the notice. I've received it. I don't. Doesn't mean that you agree with it. Doesn't mean you accept it. Uh, it just means that you've received it. So I have some buyers sometimes. Like, I don't. You know, the, they just the, they say something's wrong with the roof. I don't want to accept it. You're not accepting it. You're signing off the fact that you've just received it, and now that you know something is wrong with the roof. All right. Um, it also talks about the acceptance of the property uh, in as-is condition. I have people that want to cross that paragraph out. And they said, I don't want to accept it. I haven't done my inspections. When they're in this particular section, what they're essentially saying is uh, that you're accepting an as is condition at the time of um, contract. It doesn't mean that you will not come back and ask them for repairs or some type of relief, monetary relief, uh, because you found something. And this uh, particular section also says that, well, I'm still going to do my inspections, but I already know I want you to replace the roof. Or I'm still going to do my inspections, but I already know I want you to replace uh, the uh, fence outside. Or I've seen something already that I need you to do. So there is a checkbox in here that allows you not to accept it in its current condition that you already know that you want them to do three or four things and we would list those things out at their expense. But that does not preclude you from having an inspection and asking them to do additional items as well. Uh, section also goes into lender required repairs for you buyers out there that buy a property that may have some things that are significantly wrong with it, but you're still interested in it. If the lender comes back and says, hey, we'll lend on this, but uh, it's a $100,000 house and you're going to have to do $25,000 worth of repairs for us to even lend on it. And you go to the seller and say, hey, I need you to do these repairs so I can get it financed. Well, that's over 5% of the value of the property uh, per the contract. And so this allows the seller to opt out. Uh, uh, if it exceeds 5%. Um, it also talks about the seller, any negotiated uh, repairs that have been done are to be completed prior uh, to closing uh, and that the buyers advised that, um, uh, that they should uh, get an environmental um, 
uh, and I, I I lost just lost my uh, thought, and that's okay because this is real. This is live. This is what the the tech, the, uh, the real estate of life uh, talks about. Anyway, that was me trying to cover up the fact that I just lost my thought. <laughs> Environmental matters. Um, ba ba buyers advise that the presence of wetlands, toxic substance, and the besters and all those other things, the presence of that, they should basically get that checked out. All right. All right. So and then residential service contract. What is that? All right. It's also known as a home warranty. So the contract does allow for the seller. Uh, to pay for a home warranty. What is a home warranty? Again, I'll, I'll have a home warranty rep on here at some point in time, but essentially it's a warranty against the physical systems of the house. So the plumbing, the HVAC, the uh, AC, the heating, um, the uh, they can cover pools, they can cover garage door openers, things of that nature. And so there's a provision in this particular section that essentially says that, hey, Mr. Seller, we want you to make us feel warm and fuzzy, and we want you to pay for one year, two year, or, or X amount of dollars towards a residential service contract also known as a home warranty, right? Uh, and so um, broker's fees, we got to get paid, right? It's one sentence. It just says all obligations of the parties for payment for broker's fees are contained in a separate written agreement. So what does that mean? Typically, the brokers are paid for by the seller, typically. That is a negotiable point, but nine times out of ten, the seller is paying the broker's fees. Um, now, sometimes when I represent buyers and the, the seller has said, hey, I'm not paying a broker, but you can represent someone, then, yeah, will I look towards a buyer to compensate me for the value and the knowledge that I have? I absolutely will, and I would have a separate written agreement with it. So that's just a one sentence in, in uh, paragraph eight. Paragraph nine says, when are we closing? When are we closing? Right? So when are we closing? And so you put a date in there. Uh, or within seven days after the objections uh, uh, are made as far as the title is concerned. Now, at closing, it talks about what happens at closing. There's closing, and then there's funding. Closing is the physical signing of the documents, where you actually go in and you sign all the documents saying that I'm buying this house or I'm selling this house. And then funding is, if it's a cash deal, once the title company receives the money, they disperse, then the transaction is complete. Uh, if it's a loan, once the bank sends the money to the title company uh, and they got all the things that they need, then the transaction is complete. So closing is one thing, but the actual uh, to own the property or to sell the property, it's closing and funding. And so there's some language in here as to uh, that particular uh, deal. It also talks about if you're buying a property that's being leased out, that the seller has to transfer the deposits on those leases and things of that nature. Now, 10, I talked about closing and funding. Uh, because in 10, they talk about when can I take possession? I just bought it. I just closed. I'm ready to take possession. But let's say something happens. I'm taping this on a Friday. If I have a late closing on a Friday and I close at, say, 5 o'clock on a Friday or 4.30 uh, and, and banks can no longer send out wires after 3 o'clock, I think it's uh, uh, Eastern time, uh, then I might close on a Friday, but I might not be able to take possession until Monday because upon closing and funding, right, it's not just closing. Uh, it's closing and funding unless I execute a separate agreement or have a separate agreement that, hey, I know it's going to fund Monday. Mr. Seller, will you allow me access over the weekend so I can move? And then we would write that up as a residential temporary lease. All right. So um, goes into some more information about leases and things of that nature, because that's been an issue. Then in paragraph 11, there's special provisions. Well, Kevin, what's the special provision? Uh, it, it can be a myriad of, of, uh, of things. It, it, it could be the fact that a uh, seller is to clean, uh, have the property uh, professionally clean before uh, closing, the day of closing. It could be... Um, uh, some special um, provision as it pertains to uh, possession of certain items, even though there's a non-realty item. Uh, so it basically allows for things that are not covered uh, in the standard contract. All right. In paragraph 12, settlement and other expenses, it talks about who's going to pay for what. There's a lot of fees. There's commissions. There's title policy, which is covered earlier. Uh, there are um, closing costs uh, that the uh, lender charges. Who's going to pay for that? So this particular paragraph talks about uh, who's going to pay for those items. This is also the paragraph where a seller could offer to pay some of the buyer's closing costs or a buyer could ask the seller to pay some of their closing costs. Uh, and so th this is the paragraph where if you need... Uh, help towards closing costs as Mr. Buyer, uh, then you would say, Mr. Seller, I want you to pay $5,000 towards my closing costs so that I can um, just worry about my down payment and my some I can relieve myself of some of the requirements as it pertains to uh, purchasing uh, this particular um, home. Paragraph 13 talks about prorations. Um, what I'll say about that is that if you purchase a property, say, in August, if you're the seller, you are responsible for the taxes from 
January 1st of the year that you're selling it through the end of August. Let's say if you close at the end of August. So you will give the buyer a credit for eight months worth of taxes because you own the property uh, for eight months. Right. Uh, if you are a, um, a buyer, this is important to you. One, you'll get it credited and it'll go into your escrow account so that when when uh, uh, your taxes are due, uh, you have enough money to pay them because you will get the ultimate tax bill in that particular year. It's also important uh, to know what the prorations will be. Right. Um, and then casualty loss. Casualty loss means that if this place burns down while we're under contract, it basically says that, Mr. Seller, you're going to restore it to at the very least of what its current condition is. Uh, it also allows the buyer to terminate uh, the contract uh, and its uh, earnest money to be refunded if you cannot do that or won't do that. All right. Paragraph 15, default, says if buyer fails to comply with this contract, what, what are the buyer's rights? or the seller's rights, I should say. Uh, they can enforce specific performance, which basically sue them to make them buy the house. They can terminate the contract and receive uh, the earnest money as liquidated damages. Uh, and so, and if the seller um, defaults, it talks about what the buyer can do. They can sue them and make them sell the house. And they can also terminate and receive earnest money, uh, thereby releasing uh, both parties. In the state of Texas, we want to save you money. And in paragraph 16, we talk about mediation. And mediation basically says that uh, if um, before we go to court, doesn't preclude you from going to court, we'll go to mediation. Let's go. Let's go. It's much cheaper. Let's go sit in the rooms, hold hands and sing Kumbaya and see if we can work this out. All right. If we can't work this out, well, guess what? Paragraph 17 talks about that. Paragraph 17 talks about attorney's fees. If I sue you and I win, the loser pays the winner's attorney's fees. That's what the contract says. The loser of the suit pays the uh, winner's um, uh, attorney's fees. And so I have a whole podcast coming on, on suits. I'm um, telling y'all it's a great story. Well, not great for me because I ended up paying a lot of money. But it, it ends up being a, a, a good story But where this comes into to play. All right. 18. I think, and I'm just realizing, Mr. Producer, that uh, I'm probably going uh, long. Uh, but uh, this is just critical information that you need to know uh, that I think is going to help somebody. I'm, a, I'm a, like the pastor. I'm blessing y'all uh, with this information. 18, escrow. So escrow really talks about your earnest money. What happens to my earnest money if, uh, or to the earnest money, not my, to the earnest money if this contract does not close? What happens to the earnest money if we get into a dispute as to um, this particular contract? Very, very, very important uh, paragraph that most people skip over. And it essentially says that the escrow agent, i.e. the title company, will hold the earnest money in, in base, for lack of a better term, in trust uh, during the, for the duration of this particular contract. And if the contract does not close, then all parties must agree as to where the earnest money is going. That is the hardest part of this particular paragraph. So let's say that um, this contract does not close for various reasons and the seller feels that you should have uh, uh, been able to purchase this or, in, uh, or in, in the other case, the buyer feels wrong. And so we get into a dispute as to getting my earnest money back, right? So what happens is this goes over, paragraph 18 escrow goes over the rules as to what has to happen in order to get your earnest money back as a buyer or get the earnest money if you're a seller. And essentially, without going into a huge amount of detail, because I could probably do a podcast just on this particular paragraph, because this is where most disputes in a real estate transaction happens. I will tell you that um, most disputes end up where uh, the buyer wants their earnest money back. If they can't, if the seller refuses to sign off, because again, all parties. So four parties must sign off on getting the earnest money or, or, or delineating who gets the earnest money. The buyer, the seller, the listing broker, and the buyer's agent, if there is one, right? So all four parties must sign what's called a release of earnest money. And on that release of earnest money, it instructs the third party, non-interested title company to say, hey, of this $5,000, 5000 is going to the buyer, 5000 is going to the seller, 2000 is going to the buyer, 3000 is going to the seller, whatever the case may be. Whatever the agreement is, the negotiated agreement uh, is. Now, even if the seller is, is contractually wrong, in other words, I, they didn't follow the contract. The client contract clearly states that the seller is in default and it clearly states that I'm supposed to get my earnest money back as a buyer. The seller still has to sign off on the release of earnest money. Still. 
right? Still, even though they're contractually wrong. Vice versa, it's the same. The buyer is contractually wrong. The seller is oblig is uh, uh, contractually um, allowed to get their earnest money back. And so, therefore, um, but the buyer still has to sign off on earnest money. And sometimes buyers and sellers don't agree, and even though the contract says that they're wrong, and they won't sign. So what do I do? So one of the things you have to do is you have to make demand to the title company. Right? You have to literally in writing say, I now demand that you release my $5,000 in earnest money, no matter which side you're on. And it goes over what happens after that. If that, if that demand, um, once that demand is made to sell it, the uh, title company has to notify the other party that the demand has been made for the title company, and that other party has 15 days to respond uh, to the demand of the earnest money. And if they respond saying, I disagree, then the title company turns around and says, hey, other party, they disagree. And so if you can't get mad at the title company because they're, again, a non-interested third party. So then what happens? Well, guess what? You go to court, small claims court most of the time. because the, uh, And then you get attorneys involved or you go to Judge Judy. I'm just joking. Um, but it's kind of like that. Uh, and you go to court. So the, uh, and, and if the court rules in your favor, then the title company will follow what the court uh, and the law says. So is there any way to prevent that from happening? No. It's not. That's what the contract says. Now, you can put in special provisions, going back to special provisions, that this $5,000 earnest money is non-refundable regardless of uh, what goes on. But again, even with that language, the title company can't just release the earnest money. The seller or buyer has to uh, sign off on it. So very important. Paragraph 19 representation just says that uh, uh, all covenants, representation, warranties uh, in this contract survive closing. Right, so all rep covenants represent survive closing, so things don't just end at closing. And then federal tax requirements is really just for the seller. It talks about if you're a foreign person and in internal revenue uh, code, so um, it basically just indicates uh, that uh, as far as reporting requirements. Um, paragraph 21 that a lot of people um, skip over is notices. If, if this does go legal or um, if uh, the title company, what's the official address and your official contact uh, information for the buyer and the seller. Sometimes that might be different than your home address. You might use a P.O. box. You might use your office address. What's the email that we can legally send documents and say that we've sent them uh, the correct notices? And then paragraph 22 is the agreement of all parties. Uh, so it is this contract and all of these checklist items. So things like a third-party financing addendum that says how you're going to get finance, or if this is a seller financing, seller financing addendum, or if it's in a mandatory membership in a home organization. There are about 20 things that are listed here um, that can be checked by your agent um, or broker um, that would add to this particular contract. But what it basically is saying is that this is our entire agreement. We don't have a handshake deal on anything, or if we do have a handshake deal, it, it can't be held uh, in, in a court of law. Again, check with your attorney, but at the end of the day, this is our entire agreement. All right, getting to the end. Termination option, also known as the option period. Very important. The termination option paragraph talks about you have, for a price, the unrestricted right to cancel the contract for any reason. I always tell people, if you wake up one morning and say, oh, I thought I wanted it, but I don't. During the termination option, you don't have to give a reason. You can just say, I am terminating it based on my right to terminate it. In paragraph three, I've negotiated that I will pay the seller X amount of dollars. Sometimes it's $100. Sometimes it's $1,000. Sometimes it's 500 bucks. Sometimes it's 250 It's a negotiable point. Uh, and I've negotiated to pay that amount for 10 days, 15 days, 20 days, however many days, where I can just terminate the contract for various reasons. During the termination option period, or option period as we call it, that is typically when most buyers do their due diligence. They do their inspections. Uh, they, they send everybody and their mom through the house uh, as to, uh, or the property to determine whether um, they want the property to look at any uh, inspection issues, things of that nature. If during that period that they find something that they don't like, this is also where you renegotiate as to, seller, I want you to do repairs. Uh, it is also uh, where uh, you might say, well, hey, I don't want you to do repairs. I want to do the repairs myself, but it's going to cost me X amount of dollars for the repairs. And so therefore, uh, I want you to give me a credit towards closing or something off the price or both. So this is kind of where a, ne a negotiation period where the buyer knows that I have this property under contract now. So I have control of the property for this X amount of time. And the seller knows I have a buyer, uh, but there's some maybe some additional negotiation that needs to happen. Uber important. And then it also talks about what happens to that $1,000, $100, $500 that I put up for the earnest money. If you opt out, buyer, 
during that period, then you get your earnest money back because the contract does state that. And again, they still have to sign off on that. But the seller gets to keep the option fee. So your all in really is the option fee that you put up. If you stay under the uh, contract after this period, then there's a box that allows us to check whether uh, that will be credited towards your ultimate closing costs. And most of the time, it is. In paragraph 24, if you have an attorney, if you have an actually engaged attorney, don't just list mom and them as an attorney, uh, then this is where you would uh, 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 place the attorney's information. And that by placing that attorney's information, that also allows the title company to send stuff uh, to that attorney without getting your uh, per permission. And then... This is under paragraph 24, before you sign, there's signatures. There is executed uh, the day of and it's execution date. The most important box on this contract, in my opinion, because this is the date that starts the time tick of all the different uh, days that you put in the contract. So the option period, the, uh, uh, the time to be able to get the uh, title, the time to be able to get the survey, all of that is based on this date. So that is why it's so important that this date is always filled out. And just so you know, uh, whatever the date is that you put in here, so if I put August uh, 31st on this particular contract that I'm looking at as I review this, then my option period starts on September 1st. So it always starts the next day. So that's day one. So what I do with my clients is once we have that date, I send them meeting notices for the exp expirations of certain periods during the contract. So for the third-party financing addendum, you have 45 days or 30 days or 21 days to find financing and get approved. I put that on my calendar so that I know so we can see it coming up. I definitely put the option period date out there so that we know when the option period is up and so on and so forth. So that is a very critical date. Now, Texas law, again, check with your attorney, but Texas law has indicated that if that date is not filled out, then nomenclature has been the day that it is receded by the title company is considered the effective date. So if for whatever reason, if one of the brokers don't fill, does not fill out that um, um, that effective date, then nomenclature says when it was receded at the title company uh, effectively is the effective date. All right, in the last page of um, the uh, contract, um, uh, second to last page, it talks about the brokers, uh, who's representing who, buyer's agent, listing agent, their contact information. And then at the very bottom it says the listing broker has agreed to pay other broker X amount as a commission for bringing a buyer. So there's nothing for you to sign on this. I don't ever skip over it because people think when I skip over it that I'm trying to tell them something or hide something from them or something of that nature. So, But that page is really for the brokers involved in the transaction. Uh, and then the final page, of uh, it talks about the option fee receipt. Uh, it, it, it is an acknowledgement that I have received the option fee. We were having issues in our industry with people saying, well, I never received the option fee. And then there's language in that that said, if you never received it, uh, then it, I can terminate at any time. So now um, they make you receipt it. Um, then there's the earnest money receipt, which is the title company's acknowledgement. We've received the earnest money. They usually put the uh, check number on there and contact information on there. Uh, and then there's the contract receipt. When did I receive the contract? And then if there's additional earnest money eventually in the transaction, that's on there as well. Now, that was the residential real estate contract. I will tell you just as for those of you that might be wondering about the commercial, since I do uh, a lot, uh, mostly commercial now, uh, I will tell you uh, that the commercial contract basically has all the same provisions uh, from a general standpoint, it's, it's a lot longer. It's 21 pages and not 10 uh, because there's a lot of other things that pertain to commercial that don't pertain to residential. But as far as earnest money uh, in commercial, we talk about uh, feasibility period instead of option period, but it functions as the same thing. Uh, there's a couple more provisions as far as title. There's a couple more provisions as far as uh, mineral rights and things of that nature uh, because typically commercial can handle large tracts of land, things of that nature. But a lot of these things are things that make you go, Hmm, as it pertains to a residential contract. So I hope this was helpful. Yes, it was selfish uh, because I'm going to use this video when people want me to explain the contract. I'm going to say, well, you know what? Why don't you take a look at this and then let's talk after that. No, I'm joking. I still will explain the contract because that's the type of service I provide as a broker. So call me 281-403-3700. However, for those of you that don't want to use me, which I don't understand why you wouldn't, but if you don't, uh, I'm just joking. Uh, there are great brokers out there, great agents out there. So hopefully this will help them too if you're able to watch this and you can ask them questions and be a little bit more educated as far as the contract. So that is the real estate of life for this week. I appreciate you listening as always, and I will see you next week. Hey, thanks for listening as always. Do you have questions about any of the topics I'm talking about? If you have questions, let me know. 
email me at kevin at kevinriles.com. Again, that's kevin at kevinriles.com. I'm going to do a podcast just on the questions uh, that you guys are sending to me. So feel free to send them to me. Again, that's kevin at kevinriles.com. 